thank you all for joining us tonight uh, for the final event of Walford's 2020, uh, 2022 Women's History Month observance. Uh, this event is a Zoom webinar. The comments function has been disabled, but if you have questions for our speaker, you will be able to submit them through the Q&A function available at the bottom of the screen. And after the end of Dr. Coca's presentation, we will pose as many questions as we have time to answer. And she's indicated that she's willing to stay on as long as people have questions. So we encourage you to interact with her if you have questions after her presentation. Uh, as you may know, this year's theme has been Knowing Her Place, Women as Activists, Creators, Leaders, and Superwomen. If you were with us for our first event, you know that Dr. Catherine Dubois' unspeak uh, unspeakable series, excuse me, unsuitable series at Duke University inspired this, uh, this month's theme. But I will confess that the person that I wanted to invite to Wofford, that I built this entire program around, <laughs> is Dr. Carolyn Coca. I first met Dr. Coca more than 10 years ago at a comics conference, and I don't even remember which one now, uh, but it easily was 10 years ago. And I remember that at that time, I was just getting really serious about studying comics as through comic studies and being serious about studying comics as a genre and looking at issues. And as I was thinking about that, I was impressed by a paper that she gave on gender in comics. And I did something for the first time and the only in the first of only two times that I've done this in 25 years of going to academic conferences. I asked her for a copy of her paper. Amazingly enough, she gave it to me, which both told me something about her personality and her character, and it also gave me the start for studying gender and thinking about how we can apply gender theory and knowledge to comics, and I've now used Dr. Coca's scholarship in four of the comics courses that I have taught, including my most recent course in honor of Wonder Woman's 80th anniversary. Oh, I'm certainly not the only person who is impressed by her scholarship. I will be forever jealous of her because she has won an Eisner Award for her 2016 book, Superwomen, Gender, Power, and Representation. If you are not familiar with the Eisner Awards, first, shame on you. But second, the Eisner Awards are often described as the comics industry's Oscar Awards. Officially, they... <clears throat> They are annual awards given for creative achievement in American comic books and in comic book scholarship. So this is a very impressive and important uh, recognition for her important scholarship about gender in comics. Dr. Co Dr. Coca's scholarly engagement with comics demonstrates the best of the liberal arts tradition. She is a professor of politics, economics, and law at State University of New York's College at Westbury. She earned her BA in political science and media studies from Fordham University and her PhD from NYU's Department of Politics. A scholar of gender and sexuality, civil liberties and civil rights, she is also the author of 2004's Jailbait, The Politics of Statutory Rape Laws in the United States, the editor of 2006's Adolescent Sexuality, and the author of 2020's Wonder Woman and Captain Marvel, Militarism and Feminism in Comics and Film. Tonight, Dr. Coco will be presenting Superwomen and Social Change, Diversity, Inclusion and Equity in Superhero Comics, TV and Film. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Carolyn Coca. Oh, thank you so much for that introduction. I am very happy to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm going to uh, share my screen so you can see some fun images while I'm talking. Okay. Hope everyone can see all of this all right. So I'm just going to start assuming the screen is working. All right. So these two pictures that you're seeing pretty much sum up what I'm going to talk about tonight, because on the left, you have a typical movie poster, one woman, several men, a common ratio in fiction and in political and social institutions and corporations in real life, the men facing front, muscled and strong and ready for action, the woman facing away so we can see her behind in some of her breasts. But recently, we've been seeing more of what's on the right, a clever critique of the types of images we've come to take for granted and the power relations we've come to take for granted. So I'm going to talk about how we arrived at this moment, both at the picture on the left, we've become so used to that we barely even see it anymore, and the parody on the right that pushes us to think about how we deal with representation and gender and race and power in the US today. And I'm going to talk about why both pictures are important. Now, I do this work for several reasons, but the main reason is that representation matters because 
there's great power in storytelling. What's on the page and the screen can open up all kinds of possibilities, can make it easier to imagine ourselves as heroes. But historically, our stories have centered certain people and marginalized and stereotyped and excluded others. I'm gonna show you a couple of quick illustrations of what this exclusion can look like. When my book, Superwomen, first came out, I tried to show a friend its Amazon page. But when I typed the title, Superwomen, in the search bar, Amazon assumed I mistyped and said, showing results for Superman. If I type the words superwomen or superheroine on any computer, those, lines get those words get underlined in red as a misspelling. But the words supermen and superhero don't, because in our world, we're meant to believe the words super and men go together, but the words super and women do not. Super women are excluded. And have you noticed that very few people say male superhero or white superhero when that's what they mean? They just say superhero and the male and white is implied, but most people use modifiers when they're talking about a female superhero or a black superhero or a queer superhero or a working class superhero or a disabled superhero, like they're an exception to some unwritten rule. And the unwritten rule, the idea that we've been taught is that certain people are super and are heroes and the rest of us are othered and excluded. If you Google the word hero, this is what you get. If you Google the word leader, this is what you get. If you ask business people to draw an effective leader, this is what you get. Now this is disheartening, but it probably shouldn't be a surprise because this is what most media have shown us our whole lives. And it's what political and economic and social institutions have shown us our whole lives. This is what exclusion looks like. These institutions, the Google images, our stories, they're all parts of the same jigsaw puzzle that is our world, and they're all changeable. We have the power to make a different world. We can use our voices to get to a place where both Superman and Superwoman are words, where the words superhero and hero and leader call to mind a variety of images, where the rooms where important decisions get made are full of all different people from all different communities, and they're all being heard and all making those decisions. You get better outcomes that way. To increase diversity and inclusion and equity. That's why I do what I do. And so to get there, I start here by shining a light on images and text that illustrate the kinds of exclusions and inequalities that we should work to change, but also pointing out how these kinds of stories can embody incredible potential. So I'm gonna talk a little comics history first, and then um, we'll talk more about kind of today's uh, comics and TV and movies and why it's all important. So in short, over the last 75 years, female superheroes have been like these pictures here, much less numerous, much more often stereotyped, much more often sexualized, and much less likely to drive the action than their male counterparts. Within this overarching pattern, there have been some disruptive moments, some stories about inspiring transgressive heroic women. At first, in the 1940s, comics were sold on newsstands, so they had to appeal to a large audience, and they did. 80 to 90% of boys and girls read comics, and adults did too. The US was at war, women contributed to that effort, and it was celebrated. As written and drawn by men, as well as a number of women, key point, multiple female characters at this time were independent and spunky and strong. Wonder Woman here was created by a man who thought that women were morally superior to men. At this time, she celebrates her strength and teaches other women to use theirs. But she's an outsider. She's a queer immigrant from an all-female island. She sees what gender roles and expectations are like in the US and wants no part of them. She's going to carry her boyfriend, Steve Trevor, if he needs it, as you can see. And she loves him, but she won't marry him because she will not pretend she's weaker than him. But after the war, women were forced out of men's jobs, including comics jobs, and into a cult of domesticity and heteronormativity in which a woman was supposed to be a wife and mother in a secondary role in a nuclear family. So as produced entirely by white men, the small number of female superheroes of the 50s, all of whom were white, upper middle class, able-bodied, slender, and attractive by white Anglo-European standards, 
became interested in domestic tasks, motherhood, and romance with men, like Wonder Woman here on the right with her fuller lips and wider eyes. She's not wearing boots or carrying Steve. She's wearing delicate sandals while he's carrying her. And she's crying because this monster that she's marrying is being mean, so she wants to please him by learning how to cook. <laughs> you can see the difference in other female superheroes of the 1950s and 60s too. Jean Grey of the X-Men and Sue Storm of the Fantastic Four faint when they use their powers too much. Jean designed her costume. Sue loves fashions and cooking, but who does Sue love? The narrator doesn't know because, quote, no one can really look into the heart of a female and we suspect that she herself isn't certain. So men can't figure women out, yet they think all women love the same things and exact, act exactly the same way. I said women, but I should have said girls, because unlike Wonder Woman, most female superheroes had girl right in their names. Jean was Marvel Girl, Sue was Invisible Girl, there was Batgirl and Supergirl and Hawkgirl at this time too, in contrast to say Spider-Man and Iceman, who were teenagers but were not called Spider-Boy and Ice-Boy. So on the one hand, great, there are female superheroes, which in and of itself challenges a dominant cultural narrative of women as being weak or subordinate, but on the other hand, they're a small minority of all superheroes and they're pretty much stereotypes, conforming to what was deemed acceptable for women in terms of race, class, sexuality, and gender performance. Because there were so few female superheroes and they were also similar, these 1950s and 60s comics contributed to media erasure of most women in the world. And when the one female character in the book is written as unable to control her emotions or her powers or requires rescue by the male characters, it's a problem because when she's the only one, she carries the impossible weight of representing all women. If you had 10 female characters, it wouldn't be that big of a deal to portray one or two of them conforming to stereotypes, but there are just about never 10 female characters in the superhero genre in any medium, then or now. At this time, there were four superhero teams and they're all on this slide. The X-Men are four men and one woman, Jean. The Fantastic Four are three men and one woman, Sue. The Avengers are four men and one woman, Wasp. And the Justice League is six men and one woman, Wonder Woman. Um, Earth, of course, has a proportion of one man to one woman, population-wise. So in the late 1960s and 70s, as second wave feminism became more prominent, some creators at DC and Marvel Comics, still all men, tried to import feminist ideas into their books, but it was often a caricature of feminism, sort of cold, anti-man, and yet all the women were still interested in romance with men uh, and with fashion. That girl here has a PhD and is a librarian, later a congresswoman, but she's checking her face in her compact as Batman and Robin are calling her for help. Wonder Woman gives up her powers for her boyfriend, Steve, then he dies. So she opens a fashion boutique and she gets trained by a wise, blind, elderly Asian man named Ai Ching to be like a spy. And she dates a bunch of guys and cries over them for five years. <laughs> Both of these characters did heroic things sometimes, but both were bound by their interest in dating men. Both are engaged in feminized professions and both are generally the only women in their stories, both in comics and on TV, on the, the Batman 66 and the Wonder Woman uh, 77 TV shows. You see this singularity in movies of the time as well, having one woman, uh, like Star Wars. There's basically one woman in the original trilogy and that's Leia. If you add up, all of the time that women other than Leia are on screen and talking in all three movies put together, it's 63 seconds, one minute out of 376 minutes of film. And note her transition from fully clothed to uh, bikini clad here, because that's going to happen in comics as well. So the singular women's outfits change as after the second wave of feminism really gets going, so does backlash to it. And part of that backlash is a reassertion of binary gender roles in an industry with so few women working in it, I could count them on one hand. So see how the men are all muscle and all covered while the women have their hips out and the big hair flowing and their breasts are bigger while the fabric holding them in is smaller. They still do heroic things, but the framing focuses the reader on their looks. And when there's only one woman in the room, the implication is that yes, women can be heroes, but it's also that since she's the only one, there must be something super exceptional about her, 
or that to be a female hero, uh, you have to be scantily clad. The 1970s, 80s X-Men were somewhat of an exception to these trends. They often had more than one woman on a team and some differences of age, race, ethnicity, body type, religion, and personality. And you know, some of these characters were quite powerful and still are beloved, but they embodied stereotypes too. Like Storm controls the weather, which kind of exemplifies a trope of Africans ties to nature. And she would lose that control if she got emotional, exemplifying the trope of women as emotional. The Chinese American Jubilee has fireworks powers because she's Chinese and she loves them all because girls love shopping. Danny Moonstar is Cheyenne, so her original powers were related to visions and communicating with animals, you get the idea. So qualitatively for decades, the X-Men have had multiple prominent female characters, some of whom are females of color, some of whom have disabilities, some of whom are queer, but quantitatively, all X teams have been dominated by white, non-disabled, non-queer males. Other female superheroes of color both challenged and embodied stereotypes too. And in general, white female characters were more central to the action and more powerful than those of color. The female characters of color were also more usually more exoticized in terms of dress and powers too. Um, so the small number of black female superheroes generally had animalistic powers or clothing like Vixen here on the left and also Panther and Bumblebee and Ladyhawk all with the powers of animals. Um, and or sometimes they might be as in other media written and drawn as caregiving mammies or sexy Jezebels or angry sapphires or with black exploitation elements like Monica Rambeau or Misty Knight here. Asian female superheroes were usually martial arts experts with swords, and yet they were usually defeated by white male characters. So here's Colleen Wing and Psylocke and Katana, all with swords. Other Asian or Asian American side characters at this time were often submissive China dolls or sexy geisha girls, while Asian female villains were usually untrustworthy dragon ladies. And when there's only one character of color in a given story, if any, that means, again, that she has to stand in for all women matching her demographics. So if she's written stereotypically, she might reinforce those stereotypes for some, introduce them to others, and of course, also foster opposition in readers who know that there's more to women of color than one note cliched tropes. The space is always there for us to rework and reform and resist these kinds of portrayals. So you have these stereotypes of African-American and Asian-American characters, and there really weren't any um, prominent South Asian or Middle Eastern or Latin American female characters at all in mainstream superhero media before the 90s, the 1990s, which meant that large swaths of the world's women were just erased, excluded from the superhero genre. So you know, readers of those demographics could either cross-identify or stop reading. And that became even more of an issue in the 90s because that was when mainstream superhero comics changed drastically. The growth of the direct market of local comic shops, as opposed to how they've been sold on newsstands, higher paper costs, higher sticker prices, company, companies emphasizing royalties based on high sales of superhero comics and merchandise, and a loosening of the content governing comics code in 1989, all homogenized the comics fan base. It became older, more male, more white, et cetera. And this coincides with a conservative backlash against feminist and civil rights and LGBTQ movements. It was of course also a time of progressive activism, third wave feminism, slightly increasing diversity among comic writers and artists and, and underground comics too. But you have these, amidst these, these cross-cutting pressures and due to the specific creative people involved, what you saw at this time was male artists drawing hyper-muscular male characters and hyper-sexualized female characters. Um, some readers loved it and some didn't distinguish what they saw as the sexiness of the female subjects from their sexualization as objects. Others saw the objectification and read around it and others just stopped reading. Then as now, some fans and artists did not see the difference between the way female and male superheroes were drawn, but there are clear differences. The males are posed straight on, fully clothed with a focus on their muscles and their power. You know, they're active athletic heroes, but the females, a much smaller number are posed from the side in skimpier clothing with a focus on their TNA, like they're just to be looked at. So focus on the image on the left for a second. Um, how Wonder Woman looks compared to the male characters in that image. And 
think about how male characters are never drawn like that. And they're not because when they are, you can see how absurd it is. But with female characters, we're so used to it. We're so used to the sexualization. And I'm not critiquing sexiness here or posing some characters like this some of the time. I'm critiquing sexualization where all the women are submissively posed, scantily clad objects waiting for men to act on them across decades of comics. And people usually laugh um, at the image on the right, and I have too, but there's something else to consider here, which is that this isn't just problematic for women, it is for men too. We're taught that this is just not what real men are supposed to look like, so it's uncomfortable to see, but not allowing men to show what we have labeled femininity isn't fair either. You know, binary gender roles and expectations are confining for everyone. Now, there is a more extreme version of this kind of pose. You saw it on the 90s slide, the 1990s slide, which is that if you can see both curves of their behind and both of their breasts at the same time, such that their back would have to be broken to hold that position, that's the broke back pose. Male characters are never posed broke back. This is how they look when they are. And if the media that you're looking at or creating has failed the Brokeback test, it's probably also failed what comics writer Kelly Sue DeConnick calls the sexy lamp test. When the female character is so superfluous to the action, she could be replaced with a sexy lamp and the plot would still function just the same. This is when women are more eye candy than hero. Like, is there any narrative reason for these women to be on these pages? Is this how you would stand if you were talking to someone or about to engage in combat? And the, uh, this butt to the front pose, it's not just in comics, it's done with real women too, as you already saw here. Not with men though, as the parody on the right makes clear, but with women all the time. Look at these movie posters. These poses focus us not on women's personhood, but on their parts. Now, women's personhood in media, or lack thereof, inspired another test, the Bechtel test. Are there at least two female characters with names who speak to one another about something other than a man? Most superhero works fail it still. Now, this Bechtel test is not perfect. A good movie can fail it, and a bad movie can pass it, and a movie can pass with one irrelevant sentence between two women. But this bar is so low two women who talk to each other about something other than a man, it shows you very quickly that most movies center men and women are often on the sidelines or just window dressing. And while you can see there has been, there was improvement from the 1970s to the 1990s, you can also see there's been virtually no change from the 90s to almost today. Try to imagine the opposite of this, that half of movies fail the test if the test were, do two men talk to each other about something other than a woman? That is hard to imagine. Another plot device that still sidelines and objectifies female characters is called fridging. It comes from the phrase women in refrigerators coined by comics writer Gail Simone. It refers to Green Lantern's angst when he opened his fridge and found his dead girlfriend in it on the upper left. So fridging is when female characters are made the targets of violence, especially sexualized violence. Um, and then the plot of the story explores the violence's effect on the male characters and their development. Trinity syndrome is similar, like in The Matrix or in Ant-Man, both good movies that fail the Bechdel test. This is when a female character starts off as more skilled than a male character and then trains him up. So he surpasses her and then he becomes the protagonist and falls in love with her and she's either sidelined or becomes like a prize for him to win or she's killed or all of these things. <laughs> so underrepresentation and stereotyping and broken backs and sexy lamps, and fridgings, and Trinity syndrome, and Bechdel test failures are all narrative devices in superhero stories and other stories that display women as one-dimensional objects rather than portraying them as multi-dimensional people central to their own lives. Almost 100% of the time, even today, when uh, the people who are writing, drawing, producing, or directing these types of stories are not women. And when women don't get to tell stories, women's stories don't generally get told. So women's power is subverted. 
when they are included, when women are in the driver's seat creatively, statistics show that they will hire more women to be behind the scenes. They will put more women in front of the camera or on the page, and they will produce more multifaceted female characters. This is also true of other groups who have historically been excluded from power. Um, for instance, the character that inspired Gail Simone to talk about women in refrigerators was Barbara Gordon. Only written and drawn by men, she was Batgirl for years and then shot and paralyzed and sexually assaulted and photographed on the bottom left here. That whole story is about the effects of all that, not on Barbara, but on her father, Police Commissioner Jim Gordon, and on Batman. But different writers, Kim Yale and John Ostrander, wife and husband, later came up with the idea of giving Barbara a new alter ego called Oracle, here on the left an information broker, a team leader, and a wheelchair user. And Gail Simone herself wrote Oracle for a few years, and Kim Yale and Gail Simone are two of only a small number of women who have written that character since 1967. There aren't too many super women or characters with disabilities who are as nuanced as Oracle. She lives with a disability and fights crime. She has advanced degrees. She has friends and romantic relationships and mentees. But it's important to note also that she's white, cisgender, heterosexual, and wealthy, and she's sometimes written, not unlike other characters with disabilities, as a super crip whom everyone admires for moving past their disability and achieving great things. Barbara and other disabled characters also tend to have a power that counterbalances their disability, like she, with a PhD and a JD, has a photographic memory. The lawyer Daredevil has radar-like sight in his mind, and Professor X has telepathy. Misty Knight, Karma, Cyborg, and Forge all have limb prostheses. There's a pattern. The white characters have professional degrees and super mental abilities and pass as non-disabled, and the characters of color with disabilities have visible enhancements increasing their physical strength, which presents some uncomfortable stereotypes of race. Characters with disabilities across media have almost always been written by non-disabled people, and they've often had their disability as the main feature of their characterization, as opposed to just one aspect of it. Or they have difficulty accepting the disability, or they're usually alone or lonely and don't have a significant other. And these same trends can be seen historically in LGBTQIA characters, again, almost always written by non-queer people, where gender and or sexuality defines the character, the character struggles with their gender or sexuality, the character's often alone or lonely. Sometimes these queer or disabled bodies are drawn much differently from non-queer, non-disabled bodies, sometimes more sexualized, as you see here with Barbara and Misty and the breasts, sometimes much less uh, to the point of their being asexualized. Oops, sorry, <laughs> but the portrayals of these characters here, um, they're all quite, quite recent, and some of them by queer female authors and artists have not really followed those same tropes. If I were to show you a slide of lesbian, bisexual, trans, queer, super women from before the last several years, this would be a mostly empty slide, except for Mystique from the X-Men. So there is diversity here in terms of race and ethnicity and sexuality, but not so much in terms of body type or age or abilities. So today, we are seeing more queer characters, more characters with disabilities, more racially and ethnically diverse characters, some diversity in personalities and a little bit in body types. We're seeing more female characters, period. And this has been the case from the late 2000s to today. Um, there are numerous factors, one of which is more diversity and inclusion, more women behind the scenes, like I said, but it's also because of a, a lot of other factors, changing national demographics, the gains of various civil rights movements, the rise of social media for instant communication between fans and between fans and creators, more conventions enabling face-to-face -face interactions uh, between fans and creators, all of the superhero films and TV shows and the ability to download them in digital comics without having to leave home, bookstores and libraries carrying trade paperbacks that collect comic issues, female comic shop workers and librarians organizing to recommend more diverse titles, and a vocal backlash to the old portrayals by some creators and some fans. And the backlash was to everything that I've mentioned so far, the underrepresentation, the lack of diversity, the stereotyping, the sexualization, the plot devices. And so here you see some of the new or relaunched or redesigned characters. You might notice that many of them look young. 
that maybe because superheroes do tend to look youthful and that these creatives are shooting for younger readers, but there's also evidence that some creators and editors feel that youth and small body size might make female power less threatening to the older white male readers from the 1990s. So today there are more female writers, artists, editors, and characters. Um, the creative ones are putting out more characters written with nuance and complexity and care, but although this new, ver new diversity has gotten a lot of press to the point at which it seems like lots of superhero stuff is being written or drawn by women or as starring female characters, we're talking about change that while significant and essential is still small numerically. The universe of superheroes remains overwhelmingly male and white and heterosexual and non-disabled. So I know this is a lot of numbers on here. I'll, I'll just uh, talk about some of them briefly. Right now, 19% of superhero TV shows airing this year star women. There are three out of 16 now, and there are another six in development. So nine out of 31 total. The figure for this year is about the same number as when you count every superhero TV show from the last 70 years, 19%. And they were pretty spread, spread pretty evenly um, across that time period. For movies, about 15% of superhero movies with release dates this year and next star women, two out of 13. There are another eight in development to make 10 out of 46 total. You can see the historic numbers for movies too. Um, counting from 55 years ago, 9% have starred women and most of them are from the last, just the last few years. Similarly to the movies, about 15% of superhero comics on sale right now star female characters. Um, a smaller percentage than that are written and or drawn by women. As points of comparison to the 15% figure, in 2010, 6% of mainstream superhero comics starred women, and in 2000, 5% starred women. So you can see these are small numbers. And most of the female characters and actresses and creators are still white, heterosexual, non-disabled, et cetera. So qualitatively, there are changes, but quantitatively, the change is small. There is some diversity here, some inclusion here of those formerly excluded. So it seems like the big companies have decided that marketizing diversity is profitable but only to a point, and that point is not yet equity. Recent movies illustrate this too. Marvel's Black Panther and Captain Marvel both show us women who are not underrepresented, stereotyped, sexualized side characters. Both had more women and people of color behind the scenes than past Marvel movies. This is also true of the Black Widow movie, but since that one came out kind of during COVID and didn't go to theaters, it's a little different in terms of audiences and profits. So I'm just gonna to stick to talking to, to these two for now. So both Black Panther and Captain Marvel have several diverse female characters who talk to each other about something other than a man who are not just romantic adjuncts to men and who are wearing practical clothes. Uh, both the movies make changes from their comics origin stories that give the women more agency because in the Black Panther comics, the Dora Milaje, the women who surround and protect Black Panther, they were introduced as teenage potential wives for him. But in the movie, they're adult warrior spies. It's a movie that centers men, yes, but the women are integral to the story too. In the Captain Marvel comics, Marvel was a, a man and a love interest for Carol. He was protecting her from the villain, Jan Rog, and an accident with a machine causes Carol to get imbued with Marvell's powers. In the movie, it's Carol that's protecting a female Marvell, and Carol chooses to destroy the machine that gives her its powers. The movie writers created the character of Maria Rambeau, and the movie's six central characters are more diverse in terms of race and gender. However, the full cast of the movie is only 25% women. DC's Aquaman and Wonder Woman exemplify some risk-taking and some backpedaling too. Aquaman is directed by and stars a man of color and a few other men of color. It has two prominent white women, but the full cast is only about 20% women. There was a lot of pressure on the 2017 Wonder Woman movie because for decades, 
if a movie starring a woman didn't succeed, it was blamed on the fact that it starred a woman. Now, of course, movies starring men fail every year, and uh, no one blames that on the maleness of the stars. The Wonder Woman movie had a female director and a female star, lots of Amazons, all of whom, whom are framed to look strong and sexy, but not sexualized. And there's Etta, who, along with her circle of friends, has been in Wonder Woman comics since the 1940s. But you can see the old ways in this movie, too because instead of Wonder Woman being born from her mother alone, shaping her from clay, and being given life by goddesses, as has been the case since the 1940s, in the movie she has a father too, king of the gods, Zeus. Instead of Etta and her friends being Wonder Woman's butt-kicking buddies, as they've been since the 1940s, the movie writers created three new male characters. It didn't have to be that way to be historically accurate because uh, 80,000 British women alone volunteered in World War I. So British Etta and her friends could have just dressed as nurses and mechanics and drivers and gone to the front with Wonder Woman. Instead of the villain being the female Dr. Maru, who's been around since 1940s comics, the movie writers created another new male character, General Ludendorff, who Maru answers to. Instead of Wonder Woman never killing, unless she's exhausted all other possibilities first, as has been the case since the 1940s, in the movie, she kills a bunch of, of soldiers. Instead of her being inspired by all she's learned from the Amazons about peace and compassion, instead of pacifying the god of war, Ares, with her lasso, one of her two defensive weapons, along with her bracelets that she's had since the 1940s, in the movie, she's inspired by her love for Steve to use a sword and new bracelets that kill with CGI lightning. Because other than the female director, the decision makers were uncomfortable with what they had laid out in the first third of the movie, a woman who's part of a community of diverse heroic women. There's a common element in the Wonder Woman and Captain Marvel comics and movies that show this hesitance too. Both characters were created to be feminist and to be leaders um, in the 1940s and 60s, respectively. But writers and artists and directors seem to try to ease some people's discomfort with that by stressing their militarism. Now, both of these characters were also created with military affiliations, and their friends and their boyfriends have often been military, too. Emphasis on that has varied over the years. But lately, their stories have been very military-centric, the movies, too. There are a lot of images of oversized, sexualized weaponry, along with an absence of images of suffering and death for the often racialized others they're fighting. Our heroes rescue the defenseless, nameless, brown and black and green and blue women and children in foreign lands. Um, they push back against one or two sexist bad apples in the military, and they lead diverse teams to protect the vulnerable. But then they save the day alone in a cruciform pose. These kinds of stories show us that women can be heroes and leaders and they can build empathy for others, but they also recenter whiteness and privilege while normalizing military violence and papering over structural discrimination within the military where women and people of color are very underrepresented in leadership positions. So keeping this in mind, we should ask, what is the meaning of diversity when it's quantitatively and qualitatively more at the margins and not at the higher levels and, or not in a critical mass in an institution, whether in the military or superhero media parent companies? Is it a good start toward equity or is it just individualized tokenism that allows an institution to claim it's done enough and undercuts more collective organizing for structural change? Okay, well, sometimes it can look like this. So here's almost 80 years of Wonder Woman. See the, the man at the end there? For a whole year after the movie, the comic starred him, her brother Jason. What brother Jason, you might be asking? She, because of course, Wonder Woman has never had a brother, so it's a reasonable question. She's from an all-female island. That's kind of her thing. So after the record-breaking financial success of her movie, not to mention all the sweet stories of crying adults and empowered kids who loved it, male executives hired an all-male creative team to make up a new male character to star in the Wonder Woman comic. She wasn't even in some of the issues that year, and in others, she was only on a few of the pages. So why did they do it? 
the same reasons why only around 15% of superhero comics and movies star female characters. And as you can see here, Hulu apparently thinks the Wonder Woman movie stars Chris Pine. Anyway, the same reasons that there are bigger numbers than they were, but not that big yet. And first, it's because almost every writer and artist and executive in the mainstream superhero comics industry is male, some of whom have written and drawn great Wonder Woman stories, but the vast majority of whom have not. And most of the people who are in the industry now have been there for years doing the same old portrayals, and they're still mostly trusting new jobs only to people who look just like them while claiming they don't know any people who don't look like them who can do these jobs. They are hiring some new people. They are increasing diversity and inclusion. It's just, you know, slow. <laughs> Second, they think that the comics market is older white men buying stories each week in local comic shops because that's what they did. And they think that men won't see movies starring women and whites won't see movies starring non-whites. All of these things are false. They are coming to see it. They're getting the fact that many people buy comics in bookstores and online and through digital downloads. They see that Black Panther and Captain Marvel and Aquaman and Wonder Woman made a ton of money and that movies with more diverse creative people and casts simply make more money than movies that don't. The conventional wisdom is changing and change is happening. It is slow, but it is happening. Part of the conventional wisdom though is that, is the idea that men and boys have said that they're not interested in media starring women. And, and this is actually true. And that's not so shocking when you think of what we say to boys. We say stuff like, don't play with that doll, that's for girls. Don't play with that kitchen set, that's for girls. Oh, you throw like a girl, come on, don't cry like a girl. We use the word girl as an insult. So we're telling boys that it would be terrible for them to be anything like girls. We deal with violence against girls and women by asking girls and women what they were wearing or how they provoked it. Even if, I mean, if we even believe them at all, that something happened. We excuse unequal pay and the lack of women in leadership positions by saying women just choose different and easier jobs, especially after they have kids. We show them that despite, despite the fact that women are more than 50% of the population of earth, we show them media where women are only about 25 or 30% of the characters and only about 15 to 20% of the starring roles. And then those female characters, multiple studies show, are much less likely to be represented as leaders or mentors or professionals, much more likely to be shown only in the home, only coupled with older men, emotional or fearful, partly or fully unclothed or sexualized, slim and white and attractive in a traditional Anglo-European way across decades, across all types of media. So then people think that that's normal because we're teaching it from an early age. We're teaching it in what we say and what we do and what we show. We're teaching that girls and women are lesser, that they deserve the inequities that they get. And so then it also feels normal to see a disproportionately small number of them wherever you look. So we probably shouldn't be surprised that some men don't want to write or draw or read or watch or hire women and why they devalue and exclude women. And we probably shouldn't be surprised when there's vocal organized pushback against new and different media portrayals of women communicated through comics letter columns or on social media or podcasts, conventions, local comic shops, on sites like Rotten Tomatoes, by men who want their superheroes to only look like this, who feel under siege because around a tenth of superhero comics star female characters or are drawn or written by women, a few of whom are women of color and or queer, a few of whom are men of color and or queer. Those who are against any change in superhero media decry diversification and inclusion as political, as bringing unwanted politics into their comics, they're not seeing that the decades of discrimination and marginalization and exclusion that they're totally comfortable with have always been and continue to be just as political. And some of their pushback has included threats, serious threats against those advocating for more diversity, doxing threats, rape threats, death threats over superhero stories because female superheroes, female leaders moves toward equity feel threatening to some people. When you're in a position of privilege, when you're only about 20% of the population, but you've been shown your whole life that people who look like you are 90% of the superheroes and the real life leaders, movement toward equity feels like you're losing something. So in this environment, female superheroes and female leaders are transgressive and subversive. They're demonstrating that heroism and intelligence and strength and leadership are not male traits. They're human traits can be performed by anyone. This is what we need to be saying and seeing. 
They're human traits and we're all human. And understanding that isn't losing anything, it's gaining. We can all gain here together. So these representations I've shown you that have been repeated across decades, that makes them seem natural and normal, but they're not. This is by artist Rene Deliz. And both poses, like all art, are the product of multiple artistic and, yes, political choices. The drawing on the left is the one we're used to seeing. Every choice that's been made, eyes, lips, breasts, hands, arms, stance, posture, thighs, feet, shoes, shows a woman who's physically weak, a sexualized object waiting to be acted upon, but the one on the right shows us a sexy subject ready to act on her own behalf and others. Because there's nothing natural or normal about the pose on the left versus the one on the right. There's nothing natural or normal about the numerical imbalances, different relationships to the plot, non-diverse and stereotypical portrayals, and objectification of female characters versus male characters. The lack of women, and especially women of color and women with disabilities and non-Judeo-Christian women and queer women in rooms in real life where big decisions are being made, the sidelining of women when they are present and probably only present in small numbers, feels natural and normal because we've seen it over and over for so long too, but it's not. There is nothing, nothing natural or normal about inequality and inequity in any area of life. And we have the power to make change. We already are. We have to keep pushing, even though it seems hard, even though it seems slow, even though there's backlash. Because as I said in the beginning, representation matters. Representations of superheroes matter because they embody our hopes about goodness and justice by being brave in the face of adversity and using their strength to do good. Superhero stories are power fantasies about using power with responsibility and using it to help others. And certain groups have been overrepresented as heroes in our fiction, just like they've been overrepresented in political and economic leadership positions. They've been seeing themselves as heroes and leaders for hundreds of years, seeing limitless possibilities for themselves everywhere they look. But for far too long, underrepresented, marginalized groups have not been allowed to see those possibilities. Now, fictional characters can perpetuate traditional ideas about gender, sexuality, race, and disability stereotypical ideas that can justify devaluing and discriminating against people, but they can also subvert those stereotypes in ways that empower those who have been marginalized. So underrepresented groups need to see heroes and leaders who look like them. And overrepresented groups need to see heroes and leaders who don't look like them. Diverse, authentic representation means seeing heroes who look like you and heroes who don't look like you. And that benefits everyone because it shows all of us that anyone can be a hero. These representational inequities are changeable and social and political and economic inequities are changeable too. We need to disrupt the repetition of who's underrepresented and who's overrepresented in the superhero genre and in every institution in our world. We start with increasing diversity and inclusion, with calling out sexism and heterosexism and racism and ableism, calling them out and questioning them and pushing for authentic representation of a full spectrum of humanity to build empathy and solidarity and to achieve real equity everywhere. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We are going to, we're opening the floor now for questions. I know we have one question in the Q&A, so I will ask that question. Uh, which superheroine who has not been in a movie or TV series would you most like to see brought to the screen and why? Um, that person is actually on the way um, and her name is Kamala Khan. She is Ms. Marvel and she is a teenage uh, Pakistani American, girl who uh, who's Muslim, who lives in Jersey City, and is a fan herself of Captain Marvel. And when she first uh, became imbued with powers, um, she realized one of the things she could do was change her shape. And so she changed into looking like Captain Marvel, but the old Captain Marvel. And she found that um, as a teenage Pakistani American Muslim girl, having changed herself into uh, a white blonde woman wearing thigh high boots and uh, a skin tight uh, leotard was very uncomfortable in a number of ways. And she realized that she needed to just be herself. 
as a hero. Um, she's been likened to Spider-Man um, by a number of people in that she is sort of, she in some ways she's a very, very specific Jersey City character of, of uh, you know, a certain race, ethnicity, religion, gender. But on the other hand, the story is just totally universal about being a teenager. So I'm really looking forward to seeing her a TV show, which is coming. Um, from Marvel and her appearance in the movie called The Marvels, which should be next year. We have, we have another question. Uh, I was going to ask about Miss Marvel as well. Do you, oh. know if there, okay, do you know if there has been much blowback regarding Miss Marvel? And what's the slide that had the name Wilson on it drawn by Willow Wilson, Miss Marvel's creator? What was the middle part before okay. you said drawn by? It. Yeah, uh, that's, I'll read it again. Uh, so do you know if there has been much blowback regarding Ms. Marvel? And was the slide that had the name Wilson on it drawn by Willow Wilson, Ms. Marvel's creator? Okay, so um, G. Willow Wilson and Sana Amanat created Ms. Marvel. Um, G. Willow Wilson was the writer for the first set of books. Sana Amanat was the editor. Um, there are different people have drawn the comic over time. Uh, I think the first person was Adrian Alfano um, and he's probably best known for it, but there have been other people as well. Uh, was there blowback? Yes and no. Um, there was blowback from some of the people that I have already kind of talked about who you know, are not pleased that there's any change in the superhero genre at all. And so they were saying, oh, this is so political, you know, that they're, they're shoving their diversity down our throats. This isn't a good character at all. Why do we have to have a character like this? But part of why they were getting so angry is because Ms. Marvel got a huge amount of press. I mean, not just in sort of comics journalism outlets, but in places like the New York Times and the Washington Post. And the reason is because even though um, these guys, frankly, they were guys, were saying, nobody cares about Ms. Marvel. Uh, that was false. Ms. Marvel was the number one digital comic seller in the world. <laughs> um, and normally they don't reveal those digital comics sales figures, but I think they kind of let that leak to try to stem some of that backlash to say, look, people, not only is this an incredibly popular comic within the United States, it was almost, almost always in like the Comixology top 10 of digital downloads, um, it's, it is around the world as well. And so people who think that because they don't like it, um, it must not be popular, need to sort of look outside themselves and see that there's a whole world out there, out, outside your window. If anyone else has a question to ask, please type it in the Q&A. Uh, I did have a question. This is just a general question for persons who, have not, who are not actively studying comic studies. Beyond your work, super women, uh, what other scholars or books would you recommend that persons interested in this topic read? Or oh, geez. Okay. So off the top of my head, I think one author that you would want to check out is uh, named Jeffrey Brown. He has a few books in this area. One is called, one is about milestone comics. Um, and so I, I recommend that for that reason, milestone. Uh, this is like a longer, a longer answer than I meant it to be. Oh no. Okay. I'll, I'll just leave it at that. So my, just to say that milestone comics was, um, sort of a comics line that was founded in the nineties that was meant to center, um, characters who were characters of color. And so he has a book about, um, the milestone characters and fans of them. He has another book called dangerous curves, which is also about women in comics and women in action movies. Another one called beyond bombshells. He has a new one called love of sex, gender, and superheroes. And he has one called Batman and the Multiplicity of Identities. So I would recommend all those. Um, there's a new um, edited volume out. So every chapter is by a different person edited by Anna Papard called Super Sex. And it's about sexuality and gender in comics. Uh, there's one called Mixed Race Superheroes that's come out pretty recently. Uh, um, what's the name of the one by Deborah Whaley? Black Women in Sequence? Yes, Black Women in Sequence, thank you. Yeah, Black Women in Sequence, I would recommend that. 
Um, those, I guess those are some go-tos off the top of my head. Do you have ones to add? Oh, no, no, that, that's a, that is a great start. I always recommend that people who aren't familiar with the, with the history read Bradford Wright's book, Comic Book Nation. I always think that's a pretty good place to start. And um, if, there are a couple of other, other it depend, the other scholarship will really depend on if you're interested in characters or concepts, but I think those will be great true. introductory text. Yeah, that is a good overview. David Haydu's The Ten Cent Plague is mm -hmm. kind of like that as well. Yeah, I used to recommend Gerard Jones' Men of Tomorrow, but given his uh, predilections, I try not to recommend his books anymore. Yeah. <laughs> uh, an unfortunate um, arrest for child pornography, for those of you who may not be familiar with that story. Um, are there any additional questions in the chat? Uh, while I'm waiting for folks to chat, uh, to enter something in the chat, I do want to mention Superwoman and give you the opportunity to say something about the book if you'd like. Because again, if you'll notice on the paperback edition, it notices that you, it indicates that you've won the Eisner Award. Um, our office has purchased uh, several copies of this book, and we are making copies available for any persons who would be interested through a raffle. So if you are interested in having a copy of Superwomen, please email us at oedi at wofford.edu. Again, that email address is oedi at wofford.edu. And tomorrow at five o'clock, we will take the names of all the persons who have uh, indicated their interest and we're going to have a raffle and we're going to give away 20 copies so if you'd like to have a copy please email us again at oedi at wofford.edu and we will be happy to provide you with a copy but if, if what would you like to tell the audience about superwomen well um i guess i would say that parts of what i was talking about just now kind of come from there superwomen is basically um it's basically an analysis of 75 years of superwomen. So the, the way that I did it is I wanted to choose to, I was trying to tell sort of the history of female superheroes. Um, and the way that I did that is by trying to choose ones to focus on ones who crossed um, different media. So I tried to only talk about ones that had, that were in comics and TV or comics and TV and movies or comics and TV and movies and novels. And so that led me to um, the characters that I focused on. So there's there are chapters on Wonder Woman, on Batgirl, on the X, the women of the X-Men, which is such an odd thing to say, right? The X-Women, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the women of Star Wars and um, Captain Marvel, formerly Ms. Marvel. What I did not realize when I was, as a social scientist, designing that study in a neutral way, right? I'm going to choose characters that cross these different media. What that wound up producing was almost entirely white characters. And that I did not intend to do that. Um, so I made sure that within each chapter, I am also focusing on supporting casts uh, around all of these people. So. It's, uh, it gives me the opportunity to talk about um, diversity and inclusion often or lack thereof um, among these characters as well. So for each character, it'll basically start with their introduction and it goes all the way through till when the book was published. So if you're interested in kind of a general overview and history and analysis of female characters, you'll get that. Um, if you're interested in kind of a super deep dive on any of those characters, that's in there too. Okay, we have time for one or two more questions and we thank you all for joining us tonight. Does anyone have any questions? Because if not, I have one final question that I want to yes. ask you. I want to ask you your opinion of the second Wonder Woman movie, Wonder Woman 1984. Because when I was teaching the Wonder Woman course, that movie just came out and the mm -hmm. students disliked it intensely because it shifted back to a very a much older Wonder Woman is Earth Mother kind of portrayal. So I was curious to know what you what you think about that as a departure from the from the first Gal Gadot film. I, mean, I even felt like the first film was sort of two different films. It was like there's the 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 Themyscira part and then kind of the World War One part, and they they grafted onto each other, well or not, depending on your point of view. Um, the second one I did have more issues with than the first one. Um, it just it just felt to me like she was not driving the action so much, you know, mm -hmm. like 
um, like Steve has to encourage her to be a hero. Steve is kind of doing some detective work and piecing things together. Um, so I wasn't thrilled with that. I really wasn't thrilled with the parts in Egypt. I thought they were rather stereotypical and I particular, uh, I particularly took issue with having Gal Gadot as an Israeli citizen and of course, former soldier as everyone there has to do sort of kicking a ball around with kids in this Egyptian scene, you know, just kind of knowing that not too long ago, Palestinian kids who were kicking a ball around got bombed by Israeli rockets and died. <laughs> um, and so I just, the, I just found it difficult. I found it difficult. But you're still wearing the necklace. I'm proud of you. <laughs> well, you know, celebrating 80 years of Wonder Woman, uh, like you said. No, I think, I mean, that's it's kind of the, the whole point of what, uh, how I talk about these characters is that they're so malleable, you know? They, they, mm -hmm. they can be this awesome hero that you look up to that sort of helps you with a sense of self and to be brave and to be heroic. But on the other hand, they can also be presented in very stereotypical, disappointing kinds of ways, mm -hmm. which is why anyone who's listening should make their own, should make their own comics and novels and TV and films. Exactly. I, whenever I teach Luke Cage, I have a lot of fun showing that character's evolution for that precise reason, from black exploitation to neo black exploitation. I would mm -hmm. argue that we won't we won't have that conversation here. Thank you for those of you who are still with us. We've run a little bit over time. If there are no if there are no additional questions, please join me in thanking Dr. Coca for for being here tonight. This is the last event of Women's History Month. I hope I thank all of you who have actively participated in our events this month. We've had an interesting series of speakers and conversations, and I hope that we can continue those throughout the rest of this year and into the in, into the fall semester. I would also like to thank Dr. Tracy Revels who helped me find two of our speakers this year. Thank you very much, Dr. Revels. I would also like to thank our uh, Martin Egner and our friends with the, uh, with the marketing and communication who have been very helpful in our programming in terms of our live streaming, our promotional material and helping us do stories and get, get the word out about our programming. So again, thank you uh, very much to everyone who's participated in this in any way, shape or form. Uh, we will soon be announcing our calendar for Asian American Awareness Month. So we look forward to those events as well. We hope you'll join us for that. And if there are no final questions or concerns, then I, again, thank you all so much for coming. Have a wonderful night and go read comics. <laughs>